Welcome back to another episode of Dear Founder. I am so excited about today's guest because I might be one of her biggest customers. And when her pitch landed in my inbox from her publicist, I jumped at the opportunity to interview her. Chloe Epstein, co-founder and president of Chloe's. Welcome to Dear Founder. Thank you. Very nice to be here. I really appreciate um, your taking the time. I think it's going to be great. Of course. You know, it's funny because when I got the pitch in my inbox, I realized even being such a big fan and customer that I really had no idea your story, honestly. And I didn't. And it really wasn't until I got the pitch that I even looked into who is behind this box that is in my fridge every single week. So I'm so excited for you to be here to share. So tell us your story. Tell us how you got started. I will, but if I just have to say in response to that, that it's so interesting because that's the difference between a product that lives in the freezer and one that lives in your cabinet. Because, you know, in the back of our box, we have a little blurb about how a, a quick kind of overview of how yeah. we started. And we used to have a picture of me on the back of the box and we were getting very involved in it. And we realized, you know, we're not getting much from this the space and the box with the story, but there's more we can be doing with the space because people don't really sit there and read when it's not sitting on the table with you or so that's well, you reach into your, your yeah. freezer and you pull it yeah. out and, it's, it. and also it. like you rush it home from the grocery store and yeah. put it in the freezer. So it doesn't melt. So, yes. you know, I mean, I, I always knew it was good for me. My nutritionist actually is the one who suggested <laughs> that I, that I start eating them years ago. So I did, right. you know, but it wasn't like I did a deep dive ever to Chloe's. Like I just went yeah. by Rachel's guidance and that was it. So, oh, well, thank so you, Rachel. <laughs> She, she talks about you a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Um, so, I mean, really the inspiration behind the brand came from just my intense sweet tooth and my commitment to a healthy lifestyle. Um, when I became pregnant uh, with my first child, I really started paying attention to the quality of the foods I was eating and becoming more focused on, on removing artificial stuff from my diet. Um, shockingly, I really couldn't find anything in the freezer aisle um, that had high quality, simple ingredients that could satisfy my frozen treat cravings. So Chloe's was born from that, that void that I saw in the marketplace. Um, but we didn't start as a pop. We, we started as a, um, alternative to frozen yogurt, which I was back in the day, completely addicted to. Um, who wasn't we all were exactly I mean at the time it was low fat low calorie artificial additives at the expense of you know quality ingredients um and that was all the rage and while I was pregnant I was thinking about what I was feeding myself and what I would feed my children um I really felt like I needed to start eliminating those bad habits um so there was truly nothing out there um but my partner Michael um who's my husband's best friend from growing up he was a triathlete at the time. And he was also trying to do a little better with his diet. And he was eager to find better alternatives. And so we just started experimenting in our kitchens and throwing frozen fruit into almost, you know, any appliance we could find, juicers, Cuisinarts, blenders, whatever it was. And we just suspected there was a way to create something frozen and delicious and creamy um, using minimal ingredients and, and certainly nothing artificial. Um, so we soon started working with a restaurant consultant um, her name is Arlene Spiegel. She was terrific. Um, and she connected us with both a food scientist and also the uh, a soft serve um, machine manufacturer. And that was where we could really go test out our idea and see if it had legs and a potential to live outside of our kitchen. Um, so we took our fruit, we took water, and we learned um, through that experimenting that we needed to add sugar uh, to keep it from the mix from freezing up in the machine. Um, we had the help of this food scientist who knew how to calibrate the machines and, and produce the, you know, the taste, the texture that we were looking for. And, um, with his help, uh, we were able to create like a, a winning recipe. Um, once we figured out that it worked with other fruits, not just bananas, cause those are a little, you know, creamier by nature. Um, we tested, I think in the beginning it was, uh, mango, strawberry, and apple. And, um, we opened our first store on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And the idea was to, you know, open a few stores and, and have this product for me at the time, selfishly, it was in my wheelhouse. My kids were super young. I was always competing with the ice cream trucks that were like every other block. And I found it frustrating. So, um, you know, that was the idea. We opened the store. We were serving what we called our soft serve fruit. 
Um, we added smoothies and sundaes. And um, the idea was that everything in the store was better for you, high quality ingredients. Um, along the way, we opened a store in the Hamptons, which is a, like a popular summer spot for New Yorkers who hopefully were getting familiar with the brand and then could, you know, have a place to, to shop it over the summer. Um, we opened a downtown flagship store in Union Square, but most significantly was we started getting into food service. Um, and that was always the goal for me. I really wanted to make this more accessible to more people for kids, mostly in schools, in camps, in entertainment venues. And so we were able to do that with the mix. I mean, it was challenging because you need to have a, a soft serve machine, but um, but we, you know, we got our foot in the door with, with food service. So um, that to me was, was a big win. And then in um, 2014, we were going on The View and we wanted to experiment and do something different. We put our mix in pop molds and voila, we had the first Chloe's pop. We left the remaining ones in the freezer in our store and a big camp in the city came and bought 5,000 pops. And so we were in the pop business. And, you know, at that point, we really just shifted focus. Um, we realized we can make our products more accessible in this format. So we just started making pops in a commissary. We started selling the pops in our stores and into the existing food service accounts. And then we were able to really get to expand the food service business because now you didn't need a machine, you just needed a freezer. So that was, that was great um, in that sense. And by 2015, we were in our first supermarket as an official um, consumer packaged good. And uh, now we're in over 10,000 supermarkets across the country. Um, and, you know, the original business plan shifted, but our goal remains the same as it did when we started, you know, provide delicious, better for you eating experiences without compromising on ingredients. Um, and that's what we're always innovating and expanding with in mind. I, I love your story. Obviously I have so many questions as you saw me ferociously <laughs> writing things down, but I, first and foremost, congratulations, because it's, it's really awesome. And I, I love so many things that you just said. I mean, I love Thank you for mentioning the fact that you hired a consultant to help you with this initially. I think a lot of times founders skip over that when they're sharing their story because yeah. they just do, or they don't want people to know or whatever it might be. But for the people who are listening, I, and I think it's really important to understand the realistic nature of creating a business is oftentimes asking for outside help. We and were Neither Michael nor I were in, come from the food industry. I was not an entrepreneur. I was a lawyer. He was in finance, so he had that business experience, but, you know, we knew what we didn't know and, um, or we knew we didn't know a lot and <laughs> we didn't know how much we didn't know, but, um, that she was, she was really key to, you know, at least getting us started. And I think it's always okay to ask for help. And I yeah. always try to push people to do that or to find yeah. the help or hire the p person, or if you can't afford them to find a way to make it work. Right. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, it's like you, like you just said, that's, that person was integral to creating your business and starting your business. Mm -hmm. Are your stores still in existence? So we closed our Upper East Side location a few years ago, and we focused on the flagship. Um, once we were in supermarkets, we were really trying to put all of our energy into growing our consumer packaged good business. So we kept the Union Square store around. It was our flagship. It was a great place, you know, marketing for us. You could experience the brand from start to finish. It was the only place really you could go buy the um, soft serve without kind of hopping upon it at a at an entertainment yeah. or something. So I loved having it. Our offices were near the store. Um, Unfortunately, COVID hit hard, um, and because it wasn't the priority, we were able to, to do okay with kind of catering and delivery, but that part of the city took, was slow to come back. Um, and so we had a great relationship with um, a company called Juice Press, um, and they had been carrying our pops in a lot of their markets. And so building on that relationship, they were looking to open a store in that area, and they were happy to kind of meld the two together. And so now it's a juice press times Chloe's. It's their store, but they have our machines. They sell our soft serve. They have our freezers. They sell our, our pops. Um, and we collaborate on, on a lot of events. And so the soft serve still lives on there. It's just not, it's not our store. We don't run it. You're like the queen of the pivot. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, really and truly, which like, 
I mean, you have done so many amazing things for your business just by knowing that this isn't going to work or you need to do this. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable because I always also tell founders, you have to have that intuition to know when to make a change so that you don't lose money and you can move forward successfully. And I mean, that, that in and of itself is amazing. I mean, it's so hard, especially when, you know, you envision one thing and are, you know, married to one idea to be able to move on from it. But, um, you know, it was, I was equally excited about this new opportunity. So that made it easier, but um, it was only hard. We were, we were good at kind of like self-reflecting and seeing what was working and understanding that we needed, we needed to make these changes. What was the timeline in terms of like, what was the year that you first started? Uh, so we opened the first store in 2010. I would say we started meeting about, you know, late night around the kitchen table and in 2009. Okay. Um, so it was about a year. And then um, we got into Pops 2014 and then in the first supermarket 2015. What was the first supermarket? Uh, H-E-B. So how, and how did that happen? Did they come to you? Did you go to them? Were you looking to to get into supermarkets? Yeah, yeah, okay. We were. And it was through a series of connections and networking. And, you know, we ended up um we ended up doing like exclusively going into their stores in uh, like 75 of their stores for a you know a certain amount of time. They we allow, you know, we were so new to this, we kind of let them um design our packaging. We didn't know what we were doing. And now we look back at those packages and we're just like horrified but um it was a great I mean it was an incredible way to get the foot in the door and HEBs and has loyal loyal customers yes. and so it was a great great first step and so once you were in HEB like was did do and you the exclusivity ran out did you find it a lot easier to be able to get into other stores because yeah. you had that and yeah, and so what sure. like what came next um, we, well, they put us into a lot more of their stores and then that's a good question. We started going more local, um, in like our neck of the woods. Um, and, uh, you know, there was always that, like the, the bigger goals, like whole foods and, and all of those markets, which took a lot longer. Um, you know, they kind of want to see a proven, um, it's, it's different, like certain markets, love going for the new the new guy and certain ones want to see see something you know that you've proven um others we have to eliminate based on how much they want to charge for slotting and and all of the space on the shelf um so it was it was definitely uh you know a, a very steep learning curve for us to understand the ins and outs and that's when we really started you know hiring a more robust team to help us navigate what would you say are like for it for a for a product based founder who wants to get into retail what would you say are maybe three of your top key tips because i do think that this is often a an issue that founders face they just like you they don't have the experience and they didn't know and you know you know or they don't they are not retail people so they either hire people or you know, i've heard i've heard so many stories i could write a book on it yeah. but yeah. i would love for you to share some of that insight because i think it's important for people to hear um, and specifically for, for retailers or yeah, just, just for product. Yeah. Like if you were get, wanted to get into a retailer, like what would you, what would you do? We saw, since we were so new to the business, we came at it from, I don't think the traditional way, you know, we already had this soft serve product. We originally were making connections, trying to get this, not knowing what we were doing, trying to get the soft serve in pints in the supermarkets. So we were told, come back, this isn't going to work, you know? So we were building like the foundations of relationships from an early stage um, at different retailers. Um, and I think, so I think the advice I would say is start relationship building right away. I mean, it's, I, I, it's definitely from our perspective, we'd say our greatest strength is how well we've been able to um, foster relationships with all of our partners. Um, and I think in the beginning, not only the people that we hire, but the uh, everyone we would kind of, whose brain we would pick, would introduce us to the next person, would introduce the next person, and it just led to something else. And so um, I think that is-, is I think just... that's great advice because it's, I, I also think that a lot of times 
founders think it's like a rocket science. It's rocket science, right? And it's not, it's the basics. And it's really like going back to the basics and using those building blocks to build yeah. versus, you know, some kind of, you know, meticulous formula. It usually right, isn't. Exactly. It's really There's a no skill. real equation. Yeah. Right. You mm -hmm. just have to be smart about it and go back to the basics and use each experience to build the next, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Cause so, I think everyone's experience would you would, you probably have heard is so different and how you really get in the door. So different. And that's why I asked you, because yeah. I mean, like, you know, I've talked to Emily Grodin from Evergreen Waffles and like, she has a whole different experience in terms of manufacturing and you know, yeah. whatnot. And I, I've talked to a lot of different uh, Jessica's from granola, uh, Jessica's natural foods. It's, she's a granola company, also different experience. So, yeah. and I think it's important for everyone to hear these stories to know that there's no one right way. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, yeah. another thing that I really love and why I asked you about the timeline is because w you had this notion to build a better for you brand kind of before better, th better for you was even a thing. Like when, you know what I mean? When, when I think back to like 2009, 2010, I was still coming to New York, eating my Froyo out of the, the Froyo machines, you know, and, and th that's like not a thing anymore. You know, it also was before social media. Yes, it was. Uh, yes. You know, it was just, I remember the first person I had, I had hired as a consultant for social media because I was like, what is this? Um, so yes, it was, it was before that. Um, I had always really felt that kind of, you know, struggle between healthy eating, exercising, but loving sweets. And so it had always been something that was top of mind for me. And um, I think, you know, I grew up in a very healthy home. My mom was always like, keeping the kitchen stocked with healthy food. And so it was part of my life. I never envisioned it being like my career, but um, it was always like organically important to me. Um, and so while, you know, I, I think there, the, the trends were leaning towards, you know, getting rid of artificial, um, it definitely hadn't taken off. We even like, when we opened our first store, um, there was the the concept of self serve at these frozen yogurts were oh really God, big, yeah. and you know we were weighing the pros and cons and thinking like that would you know make so much more money. People are you know don't know how much they're serving and the weighing and that. But we felt strongly that there was such an education around this product. You know, making sure people understood there's no dairy, there's you know there are no allergen. There's it's totally three ingredients. And no matter how many times you even say it, like I would be asked, oh, so wait, but is there milk? Like, even I would say no dairy, and, you know, is there yogurt? It, so, so we really felt that interaction um, with the consumer as a new product was important. So we steered away from like what was actually a trend at that time or becoming a trend. Um, so I think in that sense, you really do have to like listen to your instincts and, um, uh, you know, feel out what you think makes more sense. When you first opened the stores in 2010 and social, there was no Instagram because I started my business that year as well. And there was not even business Facebook pages. Yeah. So, I mean, I was putting things on my personal Facebook page that I had, you know, just claimed after the EDU thing, you know, when you used to only be able, you used to only be able to be on Facebook if you had a dot EDU email. And like, it was like, oh, yeah, okay. it used to only be for students. And so like, in, it, I think it was like 2008, 2009, that went away. It was like maybe a little okay. bit before, maybe a little bit before, but when I started my business, there were no business pages. So there were no business pages when you did either. How did you, I, I, I if you, rem if you can remember, I'd love to dial it back because I think that a lot of the strategies that you and I probably used in the beginning for marketing, while not traditional today, still are very effective and still should be a part of people's marketing plans. And yeah. I would love to know how you got people in your doors. Um, so it's funny because it's a very, very good question. Um, we did hire a PR agency at the time, um, a very small um, food focused agency that, um, you know, got us a nice amount of, of coverage. Um, so that was one element of it. Uh, and we tried to do as many events as possible, host events in the store, um, you know, offer having hosting parties to schools to have the kids come after school, um, you know, 
just word of mouth type of stuff. Um, it was really event based. Um, and then hoping that the, you know, the, the small drop in the bucket for the PR would, uh, you know, have legs, which, which I, you know, it did. We had a few opportunities that we had someone from the New York Times come in and review. And suddenly there was a little bit of a buzz. We did things like, you know, when you have a line, it always looked better. So we would do sampling outside. That was huge. Um, once you have a line, you know, people just keep coming. You like are fascinated and want to wait on the line. So um, that was something we did in the beginning. We continued to do that in our, when we opened our, our store downtown a few years later, um, that always created like excitement around. Um, and then, you know, trying to get to host press events in the store as well. Um, we came up with just different crazy combinations of Sundays. We had some, we had chefs do collaborations with us where they would come up with, you know, a, a strange, you know, salsa with our mango. And, you know, then we would be able to talk about that. Um, just ways to creatively, you know, get people. Well, but part and part of the reason I ask that is because I I find now that when I'm talking to founders who did start later, like recently, yeah. you know, they're usually not doing a lot of those things. But then when they start to do a lot of those things or to think about doing a lot of those things and then they actually do them, they see an, a natural surge in their business that they didn't expect because they were so focused on the digital social media ad buys online. And there really does need to be this complementary these complementary forces that work together. And when there are, it becomes so much bigger. And so for you, it was like, you started with grassroots. I started with grassroots and then we feathered in social media and grew from there. We had that luxury and businesses now don't have that luxury. They kind of have to do it all when they start. But when right. you have a product, you have something to give away and you have something to sample and it's like your best marketing vehicle. Definitely. I mean, for us, a challenge for us is, of course, we're frozen. So, um, you know, sampling isn't like sampling a box of cookies. So we always have that challenge. Um, but, you know, being able to sample product to a like-minded audience is always, always just the best way. Just get, get it in their hands. So I'm not going to ask you about specifics, but big picture, how did you fund this operation? So Michael and I, um, we self-funded in the beginning. Um, we, you know, at, at the time we both were, this was, we were working late at night. Um, you know, he was coming from his day job. Um, and once, you know, it was, it was really a passion project for us. Um, as we developed the model, began focusing on extending, you know, the brand into the consumer packaged good. Um, it became apparent that there was, you know, significant growth potential. And we decided to raise, um, a more formal round um, consisting mostly of friends and family, um, followed by a strategic series B round, um, with more strategic, you know, partners. Uh, and in total, we raised uh, $10 million. We've mm -hmm. utilized it to, you know, fuel our growth and, and are now in the 10,000 stores. Like I said, we have, um, five lines of pops now. So we have our, our fruit pops. We have our dark chocolate dipped pops. We have um, oat milk based pops, our Marvel inspired family pack um, of pops, and then our no sugar added line. And there are about 22 different varieties. It's really amazing. <laughs> when, when you, I mean, think about it. Like you just said, this was a passion project. Did you yeah. ever think that this passion project was going to be this? I mean, you are like one yeah. of the, the queens of the frozen food, the frozen novelty aisle, you know? I mean, really and truly. No, I, I definitely did not envision this. Um, I always, you know, I loved the idea of going through it with the kids. You know, they started getting to an age where they could really participate in the evolution of it. And um, that piece of it, I think, makes it a lot easier for me to kind of balance, you know, work and home because they're so excited about it. Um, they feel invested in it. They're now at the ages where they can kind of contribute. You know, like my my one of my daughters is, you know, social media savant. And so she, you know, she's going to be helping me. We're going to embark on TikTok, which we're super late to, but, um, you know, she's the one that's been pushing me to do it. So, you know, it's interesting to have them, you know, see it from the beginning and 
in the beginning be so excited to just taste. They'd get so excited to taste and give their opinion. And then they graduated to caring about what the box looked like and giving their feedback of the box. And now it's more like the business of it that they're interested in. So, um, you know, the, the whole journey has been amazing. It's so funny you say that about your daughter because my 12 year old is on TikTok. And even though she shouldn't be on TikTok and she <laughs> is like, she is like a savant also, <laughs> you know, and she'll show these videos of like her, like holding a shampoo bottle and they get 5,000 views. And I'm like sharing really good tips that people really could use and no one wants to see them, you know? And so it's funny because she'll say, mom, you need to use a trending sound. And and, and then she'll say to me, like, can we get this newsletter so that we can both use it? Like we can share it. Like, it's very funny, but she very similarly, like she has been very invested in my 2.0 and, and getting me on TikTok and it's it's yeah. really cool to watch. It is. I mean, there are so I mean, I have such strong feelings about kids and social media, but this aspect of it is um is really interesting because I think it I gets them, you. you know, interested in other things and like whether it's business or arts or design, whatever it is. Um, look and think about things in a different way. I mean, they certainly shame me all the time. They're oh, like, me too. Doing? But um, yeah, it's it's helpful. You know, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning that you are like the queen of the pivot, and I think it's amazing. But one of the things that I want to kind of piggyback onto that is, and I think this is also really important important to point out, is your timeline. Because when someone goes to the frozen food aisle and grabs a box of Chloe's and sees your domination at shelf, because you really do, you have like so many products. And I mean, I, I they're in my freezer. So, um, you know, I can speak I can speak from, from personal experience, but you know, you don't necessarily think, oh, like this was, you know, 12 years of, of hard work. And, and and I think it's so important to point out that this has been 12 plus years of hard work and pivots and trying different things. And this wasn't an overnight success. No. And, you know, it feels, it, 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 oh, I always look back and I, we feel so new, even though we've been around for that long, it always feels new. It always feels like we're learning. There's always a challenge that you couldn't even conceive of. And after all these years, you think we'd have like seen it all. Um, But yeah, it's been a, it's been a really long time. And, you know, while we did start one way and pivoted, like you said, we, it was early on, but so the CPG piece of it has been since like 2014 and it's it's been a long time and in the beginning you know we felt like we were growing so quickly and they you know kept we kept getting called like the fastest growing um cpg brand and and um then you know then here we are we're still trying to figure it out and trying to have more of a presence um there are still so many things that we need to do better and um you know it's just it's a constant constant learning and constant figuring it out as if we were new. What have been the biggest challenges? Um, I mean, I think overall for any small startup, uh, and we still perceive ourselves that way, is just, you know, getting your message out there, um, being able to, you know, say what what you're about louder than the next the next brand that might be saying the same thing and might not really be doing what, you know, talking the talk, but not actually doing it. Um, so I think that's that's our biggest challenge just just marketing wise is the brand recognition whether it's um you know on shelf or people just knowing the brand um we are trying to be creative and and um you know figure out different ways to to get to get out there and we have a we have some exciting stuff that we're working on that we think will work towards that goal um but that's that's the biggest i think constant challenge um is just getting the name out there, no matter how, you know, I have people surrounding me that know it so well. So you start to think like, oh, of course, everyone knows it. But every day you hear someone's never heard of the brand, of course. So um, it's just that constant push to being, you know, figuring out a way to be scrappy and um, just just keep keep growing the brand recognition. And how big is your team now? Uh, We have, there's 11 of us um, on our corporate side, but we work with we work with brokers. We have, you know, so many partners and, um, you know, whether it's in the whole supply chain, um, as well as our brokers, as well as we have the um, social media, you know, so we have a lot of other partners, but on our, the Chloe's team is 11 of us. 
I love that. And I love that you just brought up the the partners because that too is something that I often share with founders that you, you don't have to do everything in house. You don't have to spend six figures to hire a full-time person for every little job. Like you can find a partner or a freelancer or a project-based employee or whatever it might be to fulfill that need mm-hmm. for you. And it's, and you have to, as a small business, you just said, we're trying to be scrappy. That's how you're scrappy. Yep. Right. We've done, you know, we've gone over the years, we've had in-house, we've had outside, we, we've done it all. And right now we're, um, we, for certain, you know, design um, and kind of social elements, we have outside help. What's next? Um, what's next? Can you say? So, I mean, I can't be specific, but okay. um, I can say that we have exciting announcements, um, both in product as well as um, just stuff for the brand. Um, we are working on Expo, the Nat- Natural Food Expo is coming up in March. So we'll hopefully be able to like make all these exciting announcements there. Um, we are, what else are we doing? We, you know, we're always, we're working now on 2023, um, our retailer and distributor plans. Um, we are, you know, just looking for more opportunities, obviously to expand um, our distribution and our retail presence. Um, TikTok is next for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're coming really- soon to a phone near you. Yes, we will be, um, you know, ready to kind of go, go live with that soon. Hopefully, you know what though? Don't be hard on yourself about that. I can't even tell you how many brands get on here and yeah. they are brands that have been around for five plus years, eight plus years, 10 plus years who haven't even mastered social media yet. And let alone TikTok. and TikTok really is, um, a source of kind of everyone's pain at the moment, especially people who like you and me have been in business for more than 10 years. You know, it's, we're used to doing things a different way. And that's one of the things that we have to learn right now. Yeah. But you know, it's out there and you're know you know, that it's, you know, effective and our audience is on it. And so we need to get there. And you will, it's not going anywhere. (laughs) So my last question, same last question I ask everyone, and that is, what are three tips that you would give another female founder who's starting out? Um, so I, I would say, uh, most importantly for, for, for me always is to always remember why you started. Um, you know, really, really, uh, stick to your mission, your core values. Um, and, you know, don't stray too far from the path may change and how you get there, but always keep focused on, on your mission and, and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I think, um, you know, don't get distracted is kind of comes, you know, is a part of that, a piece of it, but we've had experiences where unfortunately, you know, opportunities come along that might seem like fun and sexy, but are just distractions. So I think really staying, staying um, focused and not distracted. And then um, like what we talked about before always is just really working on on those relationships, both, you know, creating strong, honest, supportive relationships within the company and outside. Um, And that just goes a a very long way. Chloe Epstein, co-founder of Chloe's. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story and your knowledge and wisdom. And thank you for stocking my fridge on a weekly basis because (laughs) my family wouldn't know what to do without you. And I'm so thankful for you and your product. I appreciate that. Thank you so much.